Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the second in the Hostile Encounter series from David Holly. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. A huge, huge thank you and welcome to all your brand new subscribers over the last few weeks. Uh, it's been a huge increase. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, support and I do hope you enjoyed the channel as a whole. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story and titled Hostile Encounters The Valley of Terror. Let's get straight into that. Pain racked my body as I slowly pulled myself through the cold mud. How long had I lay in the cold, wet mud? I had no idea. A cold, steady rain fell on me as I regained consciousness. My horse was nowhere around, which was just as well because I probably couldn't have mounted it even if it was still around. Lightning flashed all around me and lit up everything for me. I could make out trees, some lying on the ground, but most standing tall and untouched by nature. Large boulders scattered here and there. I dragged myself up to one of the large trees lying on the ground, managed to get my arm across the trunk and tried pulling myself up. I managed to ease myself almost to my feet when the pain wrecked through my body and once more I had fallen face first into the mud. I don't know how I survived that night. Hell, I don't know how long I lay there in the mud. I do know I woke up shivering, soaked to the skin and colder than I ever could remember being. It was no longer raining, but the wind blowing through the trees was no gentle breeze. My left eye was swollen shut, my right eye wasn't much better. What little else I could see was through a slit. I slowly sat up, leaned my back to the down tree. The pain was bad enough that I doubled over and threw up whatever was still inside me. Most of what I puked up was blood. My head began to spin, and I felt light-headed. I laid my head back down against the tree and tried to formulate a plan. I was hurt bad. I was sick and running a fever. I expected to die. Of course, no one really expects to die, and at some point I lost consciousness and passed out again. I awakened to the smell of coffee and the smell of something being cooked. My face was swollen and it hurt to flex my fingers. My left eye was still closed and my right was swelling, but I saw a man squatting over a fire. The best I could tell about my surroundings indicated we were surrounded by large boulders and someone had cut a pine tree sapling and had formed a roof over the boulders. The fire's heat was reflecting off the surrounding rocks. I must have groaned, for the man pivoted on his heels and looked over at me. He poured a cup of coffee and brought it over and knelt beside me, helped me sit up and helped me take a sip of the coffee. I couldn't see him well, but I had the impression that he was an older man. He was speaking softly, but I couldn't understand anything. My ears were ringing. He eased me back down and I realised I was warm and dry. I tried to speak, but the man placed his hand on my shoulder and spoke soothingly. He eased me back down into a lying position and then moved away. I must have drifted off to sleep, for when I awoke, the man was sitting there, eating a bowl of stew. He smiled and once again, I tried to speak. Don't strain yourself, son. You've been sleeping peacefully since your fever broke yesterday. He must have been anticipating my next question, for he began to ease me up in a sitting position. Two days. You slept for the past two days. I found you lying in freezing cold water and mud, damn near dead. Built a trevoir and brought you here. Oh, this is an old shelter I've had here for several years. Built a good fire. Had to undress you and doctor on you a bit. The swelling's gone down on your face. You feel like trying to eat? He spooned some of the stew into my mouth, slowly and patiently, the stiffness in my hands disappearing slowly. I ate and managed to drink some coffee. It hurt to smile, but I managed a weak smile. My rescuer grinned and helped me lay back down. He stood up and moved back to his fire. He added fuel to the fire and moved away from it. He had a bedroll away from the fire. He preferred the darkest part of the shelter. I didn't know his name, and honestly, I didn't care who he was. I was alive, thanks to him. Days passed, and I grew stronger. 
The swelling in my face went down, and I was able to see again, and able to sit up on my own. I found out the man who'd saved my life was a trapper by the name of Scott. Just Scott. And if that's what he wanted to be called, it was okay with me. I chose not to mention my name, nor did Scott press me for one. He'd disappear most of the day and return with skins and once in a while a white-tailed deer. After a month, I was on my feet and a lot less sore. I had found my pistol lying beside my bedroll one morning, and now I worked to become accustomed to its feel again. I was feeling almost myself again. I had been cooking a venison stew for our evening meal when Scott came back into camp, leading a big grey horse. Figured you might need this. You telling me I need to leave, Scott? I'm telling you, I'm headed to the valley not far from here. And you're welcome to go with me, if you mind to. You have no idea who I am, Scott. I figure you're an almighty lonely man. You might be an outlaw, but I don't figure you'd be on the dodge. I figure you'll tell me who you are in good time. My name's Morgan Dawson. Ah, never heard of you. We'd been climbing higher in the hills when we levelled off to a fairly level plateau. And far below us flowed a river with some fair rapids. The valley we studied was full of trees, crooked creeks and clearings which held huge herds of deer and buffalo. Although I was fairly recovered, I still tired easily, and I wanted to catch my breath before making the descent down into this valley. The big grey gelding I rode was not my horse. Mine had left me where I fell. I certainly didn't blame it. Even the saddle I sat in belonged to someone else. Still, when Scott made his move to ride down into that valley, I was with him. I owed him my life. The trail he picked was slow, but safer than the others I'd ridden. We'd ridden about halfway down the side of this mountain when we heard the bellow. I sat up sharply and reined my horse up. Scott glanced around and had a grim expression on his face. Genosqua! He spat on the ground and we continued down the trail. A Genosqua! It seemed to me that the two years I'd spent in seclusion in northeast Texas had been the most peaceful I'd been allowed. But even in those two years of self-imposed exile, I'd heard rumours. After two years, I'd sold my cattle and had headed back farther north. I crossed the Red River at Jonesboro, and on the south shore of the Red River, there was a ferry there, and it transported me across the river into Indian territory. I was in no hurry, so I found a big shade tree with plenty of plush grass and set up camp. I put a line out and caught a couple of good fish, fried them up, smoked my pipe, and decided I'd ride northward and visit the Anglins and Henry Clay Wallace and his wife. I had no intention of riding through the area, which I was sure still held monsters. I'm not sure this time I'd visit a week or so and be out of those haunted mountains, heading into either New Mexico or Arizona before autumn fully arrived. My visit with Henry Clay Wallace and his family was uneventful. The visit with the Anglins proved to be less relaxing. Dutch and Anne Hardin were keeping time together. Dutch wanted to settle down and Anne wasn't quite ready for a sky pilot to perform a wedding. After a week, I pulled my freight and headed westward. I planned to cross into New Mexico and, depending on how the weather was, finding work and settling in for the winter months. I had a right uneventful ride. The weather turned on me as I rode west through Indian territory. The only thing I worried about were the outlaws on the Dodge and rustlers. No idea that any would know me, I hoped, this part of the country. I'd been daydreaming when a large tree branch smashed me into the face and chest, lifting me from out of my saddle. I heard a roar and couldn't get out the way of my horse as it reared and fell on me. I had hoped the horse had gone on the way as I saw no sign of it when I regained consciousness. And I began crawling. Now, here I was, still recovering, riding with an old trapper down in a remote and totally unknown valley, which apparently had a Genosqua claiming domination over this territory. As we rode, Scott whistled a tune I'd never heard before. My right hand had dropped to my pistol and I eased it up and down in my holster to make sure I could actually handle it if I needed to. Scott seemed to have his eyes in the back of his head. He turned in his saddle and grinned. Your gun hand feeling better, Dawson? Yeah. That Genosqua kind of spooked you, didn't it? He said. It just startled me. That's all. Ah, you got a right to be spooked if you are. I've seen what these critters can do to a man. And animals. Well, a Gugwe nearly did me in. A Gugwe, you say? He rode quietly for a mile or so. By now, we were in the valley and rode all along a clear stream of cold water. 
Scott reined his horse up and stood in the saddle. He half turned towards me and said, Dawson, you see where this stream winds back towards the right? I responded that I saw it. Stay on this trail. You might make that turn. Ride another three quarters of a mile and look up to your right and you'll see a large cabin built of logs and rocks. That's my place. I'm going to check some things out in my valley. There's grain and hay for the horse and a smokehouse. There should be venison, buffalo, hams, whatever you're hungry for. Make yourself at home. Uh, maybe a couple of days before I see you again. Okay, i see you when I see you. I reached across my horse and shook hands with him. He started to head north but stopped and looked back at me. Dawson, there's lots of dangerous critters in this valley. Be safe. Don't take any chances. He kicked his horse and disappeared into the trees. I sat there for a few minutes wondering if I was going to stay a while or ride on. I was healing fast. The mountain air and the rest was good for me. I reached down with my right hand and once more lifted a Colt 45. It felt good in my hand. I dropped it back into my holster and pulled a rifle I'd found in a saddle boot and checked it out. A Henry Lever action. Well, I thought. Beggars can't be choosers, as they say. I knew the Colt was mine, but Scott had provided me with a good horse, a saddle and a Henry rifle. I owed him for my rifle, and so I felt exposed, and so I felt especially obligated to stick around. I knew autumn was nearly over. I had hoped to have been in New Mexico by now, but if Scott's place was snug and well supplied, I could do worse. And besides, he said he'd never heard of me, and that was a plus. I reined up in front of the house. Whatever else he may have been or had been, Scott was a builder. His place was two stories. A barn and a small keep house lay off to the side of the house. Three other horses ran loose in the corral. I turned the big gelding loose into the corral after I removed the saddle and took it inside the barn and put it up. There was corn, oats and fresh hay stored in the barn. I heard the clucking of chickens and discovered a dozen paying hens scratching around on the outside of the barn. I started across the yard towards the house, when out the corner of my eye, I caught movement of something huge moving through the forest which surrounded the place. I stood still and watched, but whatever had been studying me had disappeared. I decided to cut some steaks off that venison he said was hanging up in the smokehouse before going inside. It was cooling off and I had no desire to come out after dark. The house was clean. I half expected there to be dust piled everywhere, but the inside of the house was clean as a whistle. Nice furniture, a cook stove, which would have been the envy of many cafes I'd eaten in. If I was going to be here through the winter, I found that Scott had a huge library of books. All kinds of books. Newspapers carefully folded and stacked in shelves. Magazines and guns filling half the hallway. Ammunition stacked and stored in a closet set up under the stairwell. And Scott was no ordinary man. I built a small fire in the cook stove and cooked a couple of steaks, made a pot of coffee and made some beans. There was no time to bake any bread as I was hungry. It was a fireplace I had built, a comfortable slow burning fire. I ate and cleaned up after myself. I poured myself another cup of coffee and stepped out onto the front porch. The moon was just rising over the surrounding mountains full and bright. I lit myself a cigar and leaned against the ceiling post. And then I heard it coming from across the stream, a roar of defiance. I heard the Genosqua roar, scream, bellow, and whoop. And there was no doubt what it was, and no doubt it was watching the place. I took another sip of the coffee, never taking my eyes off of the ridge across the stream from Scott's place. Things suddenly became still and quiet. I knew enough about wildlife to know that when everything gets quiet, you know something is going to happen. I backed up to the open door, shut and barred it from the inside. If Scott was to come home tonight, he'd better be shouting. I had no plans to open that door for any reason until the daybreak, nor was I sleeping upstairs. I took advantage of the comforts and picked a book I'd heard about, but had never read about a man who created an abomination called Frankenstein. The weather was turning, and as it began to thunder and lighten outside, I was really getting into the book. And then I heard the heavy footsteps moving across the front porch. Scott had built this place with a front window, and I watched the window. Whatever was outside would have eventually peer into the window. I reached over 
and turned the lamp down. I silently crossed the front room and retrieved my 45. I saw a shadow fill the window. I remained still. I heard it breathing heavily, a low growl rumbling in its chest. Lightning flashed, and I got a good look at it. The creature's entire head filled the window. Its red eyes swept the interior of the room, but there must have been a spot where I was standing, which prevented it from seeing me. Its upper lip curled upwards, and it snarled. It growled, and I felt it. I also got a good look at its upper incisors. The mouth of this creature was made for ripping and tearing flesh. I wondered if Scott had experienced such visits. If this creature really wanted in the house, it would have no problems coming through the door, window, or for that matter, the wall. I waited. What would it do? As quickly and with more stealth than it displayed coming onto the porch, it was gone. <sighs> I breathed a sigh of relief and strapped my gun onto my hips. Cautiously, I approached the window and glanced out. The full moon broke through the clouds momentarily, and far off in the forest behind the house, I heard a lone wolf howling. The Genosqua responded to it, and I decided to draw the window drapes. I wasn't sleeping much tonight. I drew the window drapes tight and put more wood on the fireplace, lowered the flame of the lamp. I listened to that one wolf howling, and the Genosqua respond. It seemed both were circling the place, both claiming the place as their own. My thoughts turned to Scott, and I wondered how he dealt with such situations. Then I began to wonder if he was still in the valley, and if he was okay. Two days later, he showed up just as the wind began blowing directly out of the north. The wind removed out dead leaves, remained on the non-evergreen trees, their bare branches rubbing against one another. It was kind of spooky, but I didn't let it bother me. I inspected Scott's weapons. All were quality weapons. I gave the man credit for quality. However, the more I saw of this house and its furnishings, the more I was forced to believe Scott wasn't a simple hunter and trapper, but a man of breeding and wealth. I poured another cup of coffee and sat back in a chair near the fireplace and tried to concentrate on my book, but a storm brewing outside continued to interrupt my concentration. The roars of the Genosqua and the howling of that one lone wolf had stopped. I hoped they'd found one another and had managed to sort out their differences. My watch read 9.30 in the morning when I heard a light knock on the door and a familiar voice call out, Dawson, I'm home. I'm hurt. Not bad, just bruised bad. I need to come in. I opened the door and there stood Scott. He was using a long cut tree branch as a walking stick. His long buckskin coat had a good tear on it and his rifle was missing. I helped him inside and helped him shuck his coat off and hung up his hat. He grinned at me. I had the misfortune of finding that Genosqua last night. He almost got me. He came back here last night too. Figures. Gonna have to kill him one of these days. It was my turn to smile, and he laughed. I'm not kidding, Dawson. Someday, I'm gonna surprise that critter and tear him to pieces. I've dealt with those things a time or two, Scott. They aren't real easy to kill. Now it was his turn to study me closely. Dawson, you know when you told me who you were, the name didn't register. You the same Dawson who killed a werewolf who dressed like a cavalry officer? Got himself killed a couple of years ago. Ran with a bad pack of werewolves. And they were posing as highway men. I refer to him simply as Trooper. Nice looking fellow, but a poor shot. I'm sure he was much better as a werewolf. Ha, huh, he was. He deserved what he got. Uh, how did you know him? Uh, he was my brother, Dawson. My forty-five was in my hand before he finished his sentence. Scott waited for me to holster it. You don't have anything to fear from me, Dawson. My brother and I weren't the same. Not the same now. I moved to this valley years ago. Our parents were wealthy merchants. I worked as an attorney for many years until I experienced my first transformation. It scared me. And when my father found out I'd inherited my grandfather's curse, he said he sent for a priest to come and perform an exorcism on me. Do you know what an exorcism is, my friend? It's a religious ritual used to drive a demon out of a possessed human host. Ah, uh, something like that. The priest was only partially successful. He drove the demonic spirit out, but the wolf spirit remained inside of me. My father suggested I disappear into the wilderness. 
You can see, I enjoy my comforts. I'm a wealthy man, Dawson. I enjoy living well. I built this place with my bare hands. I read books. I have tools and I build it. It took me several years of trial and error, but I got it built. Then I went back east and brought you to see here. My father set up a trust to ensure I'd always have what I needed. I changed during the full moon, but I have my humanity left intact. I can't speak, but I have never killed a human being. Do you believe me? I had holstered my gun, and for some reason, I did believe him. I had a good supply of silver bullets made back east. Top right hand drawer, please help yourself. I trust you, and just for your education, I can't turn you into a wolf by bite, scratch, or anything like that. The spirit which possessed me could have, but I can't. I scratched the back of my head and picked up the coffee pot. He held his cup out and I refilled it. Scott winked at me and said, Dawson, I'm much older than you believe. This affliction slows my aging down. I heal quicker than you, but I'm not immortal. How old do you think I am? An honest answer, please. I figured you'd be about 50 years old. Closer to 93. Why'd you build here? No human neighbors, he said with a smile. My brother was a renegade, both as a man and as a werewolf. I knew eventually he and his pack would find my retreat and want to rest here. If I had settled near human beings, I could have been disastrous. Your timely execution of my brother and his pack prevented that from ever happening. I owe you my thanks. I didn't know how to respond to this. It saved my life. And sometime last night, he'd saved it a second time by howling and challenging the Genosqua. He eased back onto the couch and closed his eyes. As he relaxed, it wasn't hard for me to believe everything he said. Scott. Yes. Was the Genosqua here when he first came, or is it a new arrival? He was quiet. I thought he had perhaps fallen to sleep. And then he said, There were about twenty of them here when I first came to this valley. There were about thirty of the similar-looking creatures with a snout, much like a bear. Gugwe? Yes. There are still several of them around, and creatures which look like werewolves, but I don't think they're werewolves in the purest sense. Some valley you have here, Scott. <laughs> yes, and I'm leaving it to you when I die. I laughed. The idea of this man dying was amusing. After all, he was a werewolf. He healed quickly, he aged slowly. And then it dawned upon me. How old do you live, Scott? Ah, I don't believe I have very much longer. The demonic spirit, which would have probably extended me a couple of hundred years at least, possibly more. But I think I've about played out my line here. When I'm gone, this is your place. I pulled my coat on and walked over to the one of the gun racks. I took a Winchester 4440 out, loaded it, and glanced over at Scott who had cleaned himself up and had sat reading an old newspaper. Scott, I'm going to take a look around. Scott looked up from his paper and nodded his head. He looked pretty good for a guy nearly a hundred years old and a self-confessed werewolf. I opened the front door and stepped out onto the cold, harsh wind. The skies were grey and I could almost feel the icy weather approaching. I began checking on the horses, chickens and hogs. Scott had a few head of cattle he kept for milk and everything looked good. As I approached the back of the barn, I caught a pungent odour I recognised as belonging to the Genosqua. The back wall was covered with deep scratches. I studied them. The Genosqua had trailed Scott back home, or had it tracked me? I was fairly certain it had been a Genosqua that had slammed me with either its hand or a Gugwe. My horse had fallen on top of me, and so it was possible since the horse was larger. Whichever had struck me lost interest and went after the horse. I continued my walk around the property. Something wet began hitting my face, and I realized this was sleet. Yeah, winter had finally arrived. I heard a roar as Scott appeared in the front door watching the rim of the slope of the mountain across the stream from us. In his hands was a 10-gauge double-barrel shotgun. He continued to watch the distant rim. Dawson, I think you should come inside now. I took a few steps, stopped looked in the direction which Scott was looking. What I saw stopped me in my mid-stride. 
and stood like a giant, mature tree, covered in dark black hair. It raised its face skyward and roared. Dawson! I didn't lose any time in returning to the house. The Genosqua took a step and began heading down the slope towards the house. We went inside and shut and barred the door. You carrying a shotgun? Why don't you transform and escape? I asked. I probably could, but I'm still human. The front wall shuddered upon impact, and the monstrous Genosqua roared in its anger and frustration. I fully expected to see Scott shed in his humanity and become a werewolf, but he was reasonably calm. He walked around the room, built a good fire in the fireplace, and opened the oven door and took out a loaf of bread he had been baking. I was amazed that he was so calm, but then again, he was a werewolf, and I imagined he would still have to be killed just as any other of his species. I knew the Genosqua liked to twist their heads off their victims around and around until they decapitated them. I looked at Scott and he knew what I was thinking. Hey Dawson, if for some reason I don't survive this, would you bury me deep in that stand of timber behind the barn? Yeah, sure, but I suspect... No, you don't suspect anything. I want you to promise me you'll bury me there. I've always thought there was a lovely place to be buried in. Another massive assault upon the walls, and the walls vibrated throughout the house. I'll go upstairs and see if I can draw his attention, Scott. No, I'll do it. You just get ready to start filling it with lead. If that doesn't work, the side room behind the couch has some dynamite, fuses and blasting caps. Scott, let's do this together. He smiled and started to move up the stairs and I heard him stumble and fall. He was pushing himself up of the staircase when I noticed the hand gripping the staircase railing. It was becoming larger. Hair was beginning to cover it. The back of his shirt was ripping, making room for a larger body. The hand I'd seen seconds before now had sharp nails for claws. I heard a deep-throated laugh and... <laughs> Don't be frightened, Dawson. He half-crawled his way up the stairs, and once he reached the second-story landing, he looked back down at me. I, now with my mouth hanging open and my eyes bugged out, I'd seen werewolves before, and Scott looked like the ones I'd seen but with two big differences. His eyes held human intelligence and he lifted a clawed hand and seemed to wave to me. And then he disappeared into one of the upstairs rooms. I was between a rock and a hard place. A gigantic ape-like creature on the outside about to smash his way in and a werewolf somewhere upstairs. I knew where the silver bullets were but I didn't feel like I needed them. There was another blow to the front wall, and I saw the tiny cracks appear on the inside. I heard an unearthly howl and silence. The Genosqua had a low growl, and something else replied. Something else had to be Scott. The Genosqua roared, and I heard his thunderous footfalls as it rushed to battle Scott. I opened the door and began firing the 4440 into the back of the Genosqua. It stopped, pivoted, and came towards me. I emptied my rifle and filled my hand with my Colt. As I fired my last shot, I prepared myself for a very violent death. But I had a thought about Scott. Hell, I didn't even know where he was until a bolt of brown and grey leaped off the front porch roof and drove the Genosqua backwards. The Genosqua bit into the shoulder of the werewolf. The wolf roared and sank its teeth into the back of the Genosqua. Its now sharp, deadly claws tore into the upper chest of the Genosqua. I couldn't believe this creature, which stood easily eight foot tall, was capable of of injuring an ape-like monster at least ten foot tall, but Scott was doing it. The Genosqua had managed to throw the snarling Scott off of him. The werewolf had landed hard among some rocks in a farmyard. I managed to reload my rifle during the fight, and now I was trying to make every shot count, but the monster continued to stalk towards me. I knew its intentions, and I knew that fleeing into the house wasn't going to help. It would simply knock down the wall, the rifle was empty again, and I grabbed the barrel and swung it like a club. But the Genosqua caught it in his massive hands and jerked it away from me. It roared and reached out to seize me, and then a strange look had come across its face. I looked at Scott. He had recovered and was now on the back of the Genosqua, ripping at its back with his teeth and those deadly claws. The Genosqua screamed, but could not reach behind him to dislodge the werewolf. I reloaded my pistol and waited. They rolled around the ice and snow that had begun to cover the ground. Scott continued to keep the Genosqua's face down in the cold ground while he stood over him and his human-like knees slashing 
downwards, with first one hand and then the other. The Genosqua began to slowly rise to its knees. I saw a genuine look of concern come across Scott's wolfen features. He lifted his face to the sky and screamed. Yes, he screamed like the damned, just before their soul is destroyed by the fires of hell. He raised his huge clawed right hand far over his head and swiftly brought it down across the Genosqua's neck, severing its head from its body. Scott's wolfen body was torn and broken, but it rose from the dead creature's body. He slowly turned in my direction, took a step and fell face first into the deepening snow. I carried his torn and broken body into the house and lay him on the leather couch. I heated water and tried to make him comfortable. Ever so slowly, he was transforming back into a man. His eyes were open. He realised he was inside and that it was warm and he was still among the living. I gently sat him up and he took a sip of water. He nodded his head and I lowered him. His wounds weren't healing and he knew that. I watched him doze off and listened to his laboured breathing. The wind had kicked up and the sounds coming from the trees rubbing their limbs together reminded me of the stories I'd heard as a kid of banshees coming to take possession of a dying person's soul. Scott had regained his human body. I saw him open his eyes and told him everything was going to be okay. He smiled weakly and said, uh, Remember your promise, Dawson. I choked back the lump that had risen in my throat. You're not going to die. You're immortal. <laughs> no, just long lived. This place is yours, Dawson. And there's a letter and deed to the place, and all my money back east. <laughs> he coughed, and I saw flecks of blood on his lips. You're... <sighs> You're like me. A lonely man. No real place of your own. <coughs> he coughed hard at this time. Thank you, Dawson. I should be thanking you. No, it was an honour to meet the man who destroyed my brother, and who allowed me to die with my dignity as a man. Scott closed his eyes, took one last ragged breath, and was gone. He'd been preparing for this day. The grave had been dug some time before and covered with wooden planks to prevent it from being filled in again. I wrapped his body in canvas I'd found in the barn and carried him to the grave. I lowered him in and covered his body. I then covered the grave with rocks and made him a marker. I studied on what to say. So, I simply carved the only name I knew was Scott. And what his last words to me had been, he died as a man. Wow, wow, absolutely chest-pounding, thrilling, intense stuff there. Thank you ever so much, David, uh, for penning that for us all. Absolutely wonderful work as ever. Guys and girls, you know the drill by now. Please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share. It really, really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. As I mentioned yesterday, I will be branching out into all available platforms such as Audible, uh, Google Play, Spotify, iTunes, etc, etc. Um, so keep your eyes peeled out for any um, updates on that over the next few weeks. And above all, guys, I hope you're all happy and well. And remember, be safe, not sorry.